Good morning from Fresh Start. I want to say what a blessing it is to be here in the house of the Lord. Another grand opportunity to stand and do the will of the Father. We uh, are still in the book of the Genesis. And uh, we didn't get very far in our last studies, just two verses uh, completed, but boy, we really highlighted and knocked the cobwebs out of the Bible uh, for me. But uh, we are going to be in Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse number 3 this morning. And so we, uh, we, we would that you'd open up your Bibles and begin this Bible study with us this morning. And before we get started, we'll ask Father for his blessings upon the reading of the Word. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. We ask, Father, for your blessings upon the reading of your word. We ask, Father, that you would open eyes and open ears to your word this morning. Allow it to land on fertile ground. Father, we'll give you the praise and the glory for all things. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2, we left off. The Bible said, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And we brought out last time about how that the word was has been changed, and it should have been in the original text as it was, became. So we'll read it as that, And the earth became without form. It became without form because Father created it perfectly. And it became without form and void. Tuhu. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I wanted to highlight just for a moment on that verse there, that part. It says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God's Spirit moved forward and made the waters do something. His spirit was so mighty that it moved upon the face of the waters. And as the waters became separated, and as we get on through, you'll see what we're speaking of. Verse number three. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So what is that saying? that Father spoke it into existence. All that Father done, He spoke into existence. He didn't need handymen or craftsmen or any help. Father spoke it and it happened. Amen? Verse number 4, And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now, we're not speaking of the S-U-N. We're not speaking of the sun, for the sun is not in view at this time. But as Father seen need, He placed light upon the earth. Now, we're going to highlight exactly what this light really is. The light in Revelations 21 and verse 23, it gives us an understanding that in that time we won't need the sun or the moon. In verse 23, did I say that right? Verse 23, chapter 21. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. The office of the Father, which is the Son, is the light thereof. So we see here that God did lighten this at that time, and He did in this time, in the book of Genesis. And we see... Also, in John's Gospel, John records the beginning. In 
verse number 5 in chapter 1 of the book of John, it says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness did not understand the light. Therefore, there is a division. There needs to be a division. And the division is a division from darkness, which we'll call the wickedness of the world, and the light, which is the good of the world. In John, verse 9, it says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. We're speaking about the works that Christ has done. The world did not know him. They did not appreciate him. But in John chapter 14... In verse number 9, Christ says here, He said, Jesus saith unto him, I Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. So what we're doing here is placing the office of, of the Father and the Son as the light of the world. This light that came upon the world at this time that made the dividing time between darkness and light was Father Himself, His Spirit, the gloryful Spirit in the office of Christ Jesus. Some may say as far as that it was the Holy Spirit that moved upon the water. I won't disagree in that because all three of the offices deserve credit for what was done in the beginning. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we see that it was. In verse number 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. There is a division in this world. And the division comes from accepting God as your personal Savior. And once you do that, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul has talked to us about First Thessalonians 5 and 5. Let's see, it's back up one. It's verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So we see that there is a division here, not only in the creation that God has done, but in our lives also. We must realize that we do not have part with darkness. We should not have any part with evil of this world. There should be a separation. Therefore, that's why the Scripture calls us the sons of light, the sons of day. There is a division, and there must need to be a division. He said, and God called, verse 5, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day now God is a divider between good and evil and we understand that but the question may come to mind why did God claim it in the evening until the morning and make it a day well the full reason of it is, is that this time, this earth that we know now came out of darkness and it became day. So therefore, it said the evening and the morning were the first day. So that begins your time frame. Now as we had spoke before in, in Peter, 
in 2 Peter 3 and 5, and on down, I believe it's in verse 8, that a day with the Lord is what? A thousand years. And a thousand years is a day. So we are proclaiming here that after this day has taken place, that it was a thousand years. That's easily understood. I've heard some say that, well, time didn't really start until man was placed in the garden. Well, well what do you do with the 7,000 years that was before? What do you do with the day of the Lord? What do you do when you see that God created and He said it was good and He said that uh, it was good and that day uh, was finished? That is a thousand years. That's how you must understand uh, the creation of the Father. This earth that we are living in today. Now, did God create this earth in this time? The earth was already created. He's bringing in uh, all the things that are needed for this dispensation for flesh man. He, at one time, had this earth and it was well, it was inhabited by large creatures. We'll call them the dinosaur at that time. And we know that there was life on the earth and that there was, well, there was uh, meat eaters and there were grass eaters and there were different types of things in this earth. The earth was... But now we're talking about the earth that is now, today. That's what Peter talks about. I want to turn there real quick. I keep getting the mind of Peter here. In 2 Peter 3, uh, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. For the earth was already created. God didn't create the earth again. Uh, he rejuvenated it. He cleansed it. And made it inhabitable for you and for I. And well, what happened to all the dinosaurs, Brother Randall? Well, they went back to the dust of the earth that they were created from. And they become many things for you and I today. As we see there that we have what's called fossil fuel and we have, well, all sorts of different things that we utilize from the first earth age. They are placed here for our good and for our work. And God's done that in a work that is, well, it's, it's beyond what man can comprehend. Verse 6, Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, if anybody has any problem with that, they need to take it up with the Lord because that's what the Scriptures teach, that the earth was being overflowed with water and it perished. That was the earth before. Seven, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And that will be the judgment of God. The Bible tells us that, and I believe it's in Hebrews 12, that, that God is a consuming fire. And that's where it will come back again unto the Father. He will cleanse it once more. Verse number 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, I've had people dispute that scripture before. They say, well, that's not what that means. That doesn't mean that the day of the Lord is a... or, or that uh, when creation came, that all that was a thousand years in a day. Uh, it says, as a day. Well, what he is saying here, in other words, to God, it is only a day. It appears to God only a day. For you and I, it's a thousand years. So it's a long length of time. In other words, time uh, is not a problem to Father, as you and I are, amen? Living in the flesh, time is not our friend. <laughs> time is our enemy. 
and it shows. But he says here in verse number 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance through the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. The firmament, I'll read on, I'll read on just a moment. Verse 7, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So, Verse 7 gives a better description than what Randall can. That means it is our heavens. It's the upper. There are waters that fill our oceans and our lakes here on this earth. And then there is a mist, a form of water in the atmosphere. In verse number 8, And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And this word heaven is nothing more than the word lofty, uh, uh, upper place, in other words. He's not speaking where he is. He's speaking of a higher elevation. Okay. Verse number 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. So land began to appear after the waters receded. What waters? The waters that Father used to destroy the first earth age. This earth as we know it has come up. The waters are beginning to recede. And Father is bringing forth this beautiful, pleasant land where man can dwell. Verse 10. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. When things are good to the Father... It pleases Him. This is His work. And it's something that is needed to be appreciated and respected and took care of. Amen? But it appears that man has done everything possible to trample over and to distort and to take away from the beauty that Father has. As we see the infrastructures of the world and the buildings and the things of it it blocks out the beauty that God has verse 11 and God said let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so Father has placed every tree and every herb that is a yielding of seed to do something. It is to stay with kind. Kind with kind. And that's to be said that there is no crossbreeding. There should not be crossbreedings between pears and bananas. Or there shouldn't be crossbreeding between wheat and barley. These seeds and herbs are to do exactly what they are to do. And it said, <clears throat> yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. In other words, this is your perennial. This is where your perennials come from. 
Every year, this seed will drop and it will do its purpose and do its work. And it will come back for you and I. Verse number 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So at this time in verse 13, we are 3,000 years up into the work of God. Verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament. And the heaven divided the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. This time that God has placed in division of night and day. And He has used this. This is the time when we will see that the sun will come into view. Not that the sun wasn't created. I didn't say that. I said that the sun will come into view into the works of God. He said these things will be for signs and seasons and for days and years. These are times that will never change. Although if we go by months or moons, they change, do they not? They all change. But when we go by the solar calendar, it does not change. It stays correct every time. That's why Father has written in His Word in the book of Exodus chapter 12 that when we are to observe the Passover, the beginning of time is the first day of the month of Nisan. That is at your spring equinox. And it will come at the same time every year. That's why Father used it. That's another study for another time. But still, we see that this is a solar calendar that never changes and it's always correct. But it appears that man uh, tries to put us into a different time frame. He gives us 30 days for some months, 28 days for some, 31 for others. And it's off in time. What that does is keeps you, well, confused. That's why man likes to turn it around and twist it around and change it. But if you go by the solar calendar, friend, you'll never be wrong. You'll be right on time. Verse 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. 16. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, which is the sun. That's the sun that you see. And the lesser light to rule the night. And that's your moon. And He made the stars also. God did not exclude the stars. Although man would argue the fact that all these things were in constellation and all these things were all gathered together and that, uh, well, a big bang uh, started all of this. Well, I'm sorry, but a big bang is not going to set the constellation into the sky. A big bang is not going to set all of the moons in orbit that the way that they are. Matter of fact, God proclaims this in His Scripture. If we look at Job chapter 38, in the book of Job, poor old Job, he had listened to men for, well, for a long time. And they done nothing but confuse him. But in Job 38, Verse 7, 
God proclaimed, he said, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, let me start over. Let me, let me go on up here. I'll start at verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by the words without knowledge? Father is proclaiming what he done in this age of time. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. In other words, get ready. Gird yourself. Prepare yourself. I want an answer. For where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Question. Declare if thou hast understanding. Job did not have understanding. Six. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? <laughs> who started this thing? Who placed it together? Question. Seven. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Question. Or who set up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? I like that part. It puts me in the mind of what I've seen at the ocean. How that the water rushes in so fast and it comes up. Then it goes right back to where it belongs because of the work of God. Nine, when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness of swaddling band for it, and break up for it, my decreed placed and set bars and doors. And he said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shalt thou thy proud waves be stayed. Father has proclaimed all of his works that he had done. I'll quit right there. I'll quit on verse number 11. But Father was the one who placed all of the stars into the heavens. And they have went nowhere. They have been placed there for a full length of time. For a reason. Well, to give us the lights that we have need of. Alright, back in Genesis chapter 1 verse 17. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Verse 18, And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. He placed these stars in the sky to give division between the light and the darkness. I'm going to go a little deeper this morning. And I want you to think along the lines of what God has done in your life. God has placed us in this work for a reason. We are here to make a division between the darkness and the light. We being the sons of God, we are here to make sure that we proclaim the love of God through the light of the world, which is Christ Jesus. If we do that, then we are in the plan of God, for this is the plan of God for your life. As a Christ man or a Christ woman, we are to make a division in the world. We are to be separate from this world. And we are to divide the darkness, which is the evil of the world, into that which is good. Verse 19, And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So we see that 4,000 years have passed. Verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly uh, the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. This is 
one of the first things that God made with life. Now, this word life in your Strong's is 5315. And it can be associated with a soul. Now, I have listened to what Pastor Arnold has said, and I agree to the point that this may proclaim that the first individuals that came, came from the waters. Again, this is not to be debated. This is a thought and something for you to choose. Those folks that he's speaking of are the ones who do all of their work and grow all of their food in the water. These folks have a dynasty and a history far longer than your and my history. Try not to bring out in a racial way anybody's race. But the race that was made from this first were those that come from the aquatics. We'll leave it at that. Verse 21, And God created whale, great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. This is 1,000 years before the creation of man. So there was a lot of animals and aquatic life that was already here when Father brought forth man. Verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so, kind after kind. 25, and God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. He was pleased with his creation. That what he brought forth were not all carnivores. They were not all meat eaters. If God would have allowed the prehistoric animal to survive, this man that he's fixing to bring forth would never have been able to survive. That's why Father brought forth the beast of the earth and the cattle and everything that creeps upon the earth. And he brought it all upon at a time when it was needed. Verse number 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we see here that Father has made through his likeness and through the angelics, man. You ever wonder what Father looks like? He looks like the structure of a man. And he said, to bring dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle. So Father had brought forth at this time fishermen, hunters, and herdsmen. There was plenty to eat and plenty to work toward. 
a lot of, well, wildlife and uh, things that are needed uh, for you and I. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. This is what we will call your sixth day creation. Sixth day man. Some would argue the fact, well, uh, now, uh, we haven't gotten to the garden yet. That's where man is. That's where man begins. But that's not what the Scriptures teach. The Scriptures teach that there were people on earth before Adam was placed in the garden. And as you put two and two together, and it makes four, it makes real good sense. For there had to be people in this earth if, well, we'll go as far as to let the cat out of the bag. If Cain was to go to the land of Nod and to take of himself a wife, there had to have been a six-day creation. There had to have been people inhabiting the earth before that man was formed in the garden. Now, the Bible says here in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. He created this man and spoke it into form. He spoke it into creation. In the image of God created he male and female, created he them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. Who? The six day people. He blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, does everybody's Bible say that this morning? It says to replenish. That means that you must do it again. To replenish. That means that there was an earth before, not a different earth, but an age. And it went away. And God said, I want you to replenish the earth. It's very important that you catch this and that you use this as a tool of teaching so that it will explain that what came from the first earth age and to the second earth age. So we'll finish. He said, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Subdue all of it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That's why when you walk up to the waters and you see that fish and it finally sees you, what does it do? It takes off. You walk outside and you want to view the beautiful birds out there in your feeder, but they all fly away. You Pull up and you see the deer in the woods and it, it spots you and then it takes off. That is that dominion that God has given you over all creatures of the earth. And it's meant for a reason. Because the opposite of that would have been what we'll say in the first earth age where there was no dominion. There was a chain of food. There was a food chain, and man would not have been on top of the food chain had there been, well, Tyrannosaurus Rex or uh, raptors or any type of that sort. Man would not have been able to survive. Science gives us understanding that these were before. You do carbon dating on fossilized remains of things from prehistoric time, the majority of your scientists will say that they are 
right around 14,000 years old. 14,000 years ago, they dropped in their place. Well, how do you account for that, Brother Randall? Well, for the first seven days, uh, we see that's 7,000 years. And man has been here for a little over 6,000 years. So we're coming right up on that 14,000 years of time that these bones have been resting in the earth. And that gives correct credibility to time. That's what God wants you to do. Not to be in the dark. God doesn't want you to be in the dark. God brought light upon this earth. He wants you to be in the light. Now, I have a little workshop that I do some work in. And, and the first thing, Claude, I do, I'll go over and I'll turn that light on. Because I've got to be able to see what I'm doing. And that helps me to know if I'm correct or wrong in what I am doing. That's the same concept of the light of this world. We need to be in the light of God. God expects you to be in the light, not just the L-I-G-H-T, the sun, but the S-U-N, the light of His Son, so that everything will appear to you clearly and you'll have good understanding. Now, you may not get all of this at one time, but you can chew on it. You can take time and, and, and learn from it and utilize it. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in thee which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So Father has brought forth herbs bearing seed and trees that bring forth fruit for you and I to utilize. Now Father has not brought in anybody yet to become a farmer. Father has only brought in fishermen and hunters but he has not brought forth in a man to till the ground. Yet. Now, he said in verse 29, he said, And behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. Herbal medication is a wonderful thing. Herbal medication will do what it's supposed to do. And there Normally, if it's used properly, it's not given an, a residue or a, uh, a storage life, per se, or, uh, or do anything harmful to you. But it was made for you to sustain life in this earth. That's why it's good to have the herbal medicines today. A lot of man-made products, a lot of man-made things can be harmful to your body. It can give out long-term problems and, uh, well, have a long shelf life in your body. And that's not good. And he said here, the fruit of the tree yielding seed, and it shall be for meat. And that's good. Every tree that bears fruit is good. Verse 30, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. God gave it for not only you and I, but for the animals of this world. As a hunter myself, I know that if I stumble across a, 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 a wild fruit tree or uh, say a persimmon or something of that nature I know that I can hunt around that area I know that animals will come around that way and they all feed upon that just like you and I do 
But what Father has made, it was perfect. It was perfect in every sense up to this point. Verse 31, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we have put in our understanding that Father created male and female on the sixth day. Not just in the garden. Now once we get into chapter number 2, you'll see the difference. We'll bring out the difference between what God had placed on the sixth day and what He had done on the eighth day. But He said it was very good. Not just good, but very good. Very good meaning that it worked. It worked harmoniously. And everything produced and it grew and it was nourishment for all things. And that was good. I like to think along the lines of how it may have been for a hunter in that day. Can you imagine all of the wildlife that was around at that time? We were talking just the other day about how that grouse is very few and far and quail and things of that nature and how that a lot of the different type of bird, fowl, and animals that we don't see a lot anymore, but they were all there at this time. And it made it very, well, easy for a man to sustain his family at that time. All right. That's Genesis chapter 1. Next service will be in Genesis chapter 2, and we'll be learning more about this seventh and eighth day. Amen? I hope that's been a help to you. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless.